Hello everyone. My name is Paul Daniel Lee, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Metaslab allocation performance in ZFS. So who am I? Uh, as I said, Paul Daniel Lee. I'm an employee at Delphix. Uh, I've been there for about seven years now. And Delphix uses ZFS for database virtualization. And we tend to have customers with a reasonably large number of high performance systems. Um, so we tend to use ZFS in situations where our customers are using uh, all SSD pools, large flash storage arrays, um, large amounts of memory. They'll be storing, you know, thousands of file system, thousands of snapshots, thousands of clones, terabytes and terabytes or more of data. Uh, and so we tend to run into some interesting performance behaviors of ZFS, especially as it sort of reaches some of its breaking points. So why am I here? Um, what sort of led to the, the work that is, uh, inspired this talk? So in late 2018, we received a number of performance escalations uh, from customers. They were running into performance problems, support escalated those to engineering, and then we formed a team to sort of try to understand what was going on. And as we dug in, we discovered a number of problems with synchronous write performance, and more specifically with allocation performance. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about sort of these problems. Uh, I'm first going to talk about what synchronous writes are versus asynchronous writes, um, how allocation works in ZFS, uh, some of the problems that we encountered, and then how we addressed those problems. So, uh, first we're going to talk about synchronous versus asynchronous writes. Normal writes when you're dealing with uh, software are uh, what you would think about as asynchronous writes. Um, these writes, you tell the file system, you know, I would like to write this data to this file at this offset, um, and then the file system will go off and write that data at some point in the future. There are no guarantees that you get about when that data will actually be stored on disk. You just know it will happen eventually. Um, in ZFS, we batch these asynchronous writes into something called transaction groups, or TXGs, uh, in order to perf improve performance and efficiency. Uh, these writes are mostly latency insensitive, not entirely, but to a large extent. Uh, really, they're just all about throughput. You want to get as many of these through as fast as possible, even if they have to take, you know, several seconds in order to get to disk. As long as you can get more and more of them through, that's all right. Uh, some writes, on the other hand, are what we call synchronous writes. Synchronous writes, uh, when you go to the file system and tell them you want to store this data, you say, don't come back until the data is actually persisted somewhere on disk. And so the file system ha will usually try to immediately issue these writes to the disk. Uh, and so these writes are really very heavily focused on latency because every millisecond that you spend uh, waiting for a write to complete is a millisecond where the program isn't issuing another write. And so your throughput is really directly tied to your latency in these uh, if you're doing a lot of synchronous writes. ZFS has a subsystem that it uses to make synchronous writes more efficient called the ZFS intent log or the ZIL. Um, the way that the ZIL works is that it sort of has specially allocated areas where it tries to put the data, and it tries to do that as fast as possible so that it can return control to the user as quickly as possible. Uh, so the ZIL is the ZFS subsystem and the blocks that it manages as part of this uh, to do synchronous writes. There's another concept in ZFS uh, that's important to understand called a separate intent log device or a slog device. Um, and this is actually just a separate disk that you attach to your pool that the ZIL will try to preferentially use to store your data. Um, so there's a lot of confusion about this in sort of online literature and documentation about ZFS. The ZIL is the ZFS subsystem and the blocks that it manages. The slog is an actual disk that you attach to your pool. Uh, so hopefully when you're reading about or writing about these things in the future um, and looking at this information online, you can sort of understand the difference between these things better and hopefully clear up any potential confusion. Um, so next we're going to talk about allocation in general and in ZFS specifically. Um, an important rule as in file, in file systems as in life is that everything goes somewhere. Um, all of your data blocks have to end up somewhere on disk. All of your indirect blocks end up somewhere on disk. File data, metadata, everything has to have a place on disk. Um, ZFS is what's called a copy on write file system. Uh, and many of you may know this already, but for those of you who don't, uh, I'll give a sort of brief explainer of this. Traditional file systems are what's referred to as sort of an update in place file system. When you modify some data or you modify some metadata, you rewrite that data in the same location where it was previously stored. Um, ZFS, on the other hand, because it's a copy on write file system, never overwrites data in place. We always write the data to a new location and modify it there. Um, and this has many very nice properties. It improves your uh, resilience against power loss. It lets you do transparent snapshotting and a bunch of other features. Uh, and importantly for us, it lets you do transparent compression. Uh, 
uh, where it just sort of ZFS will silently compress your data underneath you and then decompress it when you ask for it to be read back. Um, and it can be all done in line and it's very efficient and very fast and very nice. Um, from an allocation perspective, it does make things slightly trickier because you're no longer just storing the same size data over and over and over again, where you're not just storing you know, your, your same size data over and over because your data might compress differently every time you write it. And this ties into a concept that's very important to understand, which is the distinction between the record size and the block size. Um, ZFS has a concept called a record size, which is just sort of the basic logical unit of data in your files. Uh, by default, the record size is 128 kilobytes. So your big files would be, you know, one 128 kilobyte region, another 128 kilobyte region, and another and another and another on and on in, from a logical perspective. Um, but the way they're actually physically stored on disk, those 128 kilobytes can be a full 128 kilobyte if they don't compress, or they can be smaller, they can be 64 kilobytes or three kilobytes if they compress really well. Um, and so the logical size of the data and the physical size of the data are sort of decoupled in ZFS, which is very nice for things like transparent compression, but does make allocation even more tricky than it already would be because every write has to be in its own allocation. Because now every allocation is going to be of a different size. You can't rely on them being of consistent sizes. Um, so next we're going to talk about an important concept inside of ZFS called a meta slab. Um, a meta slab in ZFS is just a region of the disk and the data structures associated with it. Uh, the name kind of sounds like it has something to do with slab allocators. Um, that is historically true, but not for a long time now. So the name is historical and slightly misleading. Um, these days, it's just a disk region and the data structures associated with it. Um, a meta slab is about 16 gigabytes of free space on the disk, and there are about 200 of them on any given disk usually. Um, of course, this varies with larger disks and smaller disks. You have more or fewer of them of different sizes. Um, and one of the primary jobs of the meta slab is to track the allocated and free space available. So when you first import a pool, we know how many disks there are, we know how many meta slabs there are, but we don't actually know what sectors on the disks are currently in use with data and which ones we can write to, are not allocated and we can write data to. Um, and so this ties into an important concept of loaded versus unloaded meta slabs. Um, on import, all meta slabs are unloaded. And then when we need to allocate something, we need to load a meta slab so that we can know which actual sectors are free to be used. Um, and so the way that this works is that there's an on-disk data structure called a space map, which I'm not going to get too far into the details of. There are other good talks you can look at that sort of talk about how those work. Um, but we have to read in the meta slab into memory and then convert it into some sort of in-memory data structure that we can use efficiently in order to find allocatable space where we can do our allocations. Um, and so the data structures associated with these meta slabs store a lot of space related information and they store different amounts when they're loaded versus unloaded. Um, there's one piece, some, one piece of information that they always store is the idea of a weight. And a weight is really just a sort of easy heuristic where we try to reduce the overall quality of a meta slab down to a single integer so that we can com quickly compare different meta slabs in terms of quality and try to pick good ones when we're doing allocations. One piece of information that we only rec until recently stored only when the meta slab was loaded was the size of the largest free segment. Um, which you can imagine is very useful because it tells you at a glance whether or not a meta slab can satisfy a particular allocation. Um, so until recently, we only store that information when it was loaded. Another piece of information that we only store when loaded that's sort of key to the loading process is which space is allocatable versus not allocatable. And that ties into what I said before. We have these range trees that we only store in memory when we have a loaded meta slab that tell us what space is allocatable and what space is not. Um, and then there are other space trees as well. We're not going to talk about those today, but there are a number of them. Uh, and they work similarly to the allocatable tree, just for different purposes. Um, so these trees that we use to store this allocatable space are something called a range tree. So what is a range tree? Um, it's the in-memory representation that ZFS uses to store free space. It can be used to track any type of space, but we're going to be talking about free space today mostly. It's built on top of uh, binary search trees or other kinds of search trees. And there are actually two trees inside of a range tree. There's an offset sorted tree and a size sorted tree, and they sort of accomplish different goals. And so to, to break those down, I'm going to talk about this sort of example meta slab at the bottom of the slide. Um, so this example meta slab is sort of, uh, it has 11 sectors and sector zero, sector three, and sectors five through seven are all free for allocations. 
Um, and so these are this is sort of the example meta slab we're going to be talking about. So on the bottom left, you can see the offset sorted tree. And the offset sorted tree, as its name implies, is sorted by the offset of the particular free segments. And this is very useful when you're trying to do coalescing um, of free space together into you know, single larger segments. So if I were to come along to this meta slab and I was like, okay, I want a free sector four, um, and I want to sort of modify the range tree appropriately, you can quickly use the offset sorted tree to be like, okay, three to three and five to seven, if we free four, we can coalesce those into a single three to seven range. Uh, and so it's very useful for that purpose. Um, on the other hand, when you're coming along to do an allocation and you're like, okay, I have this two sector a uh, piece of data that I want to allocate, you can use the size sorted tree, which is the one on the bottom right. Um, it's a very fast way to determine, okay, uh, the five to seven region is three sectors wide, which means that I can use two sectors of it to do this allocation that I want to do. So it has these two separate trees that it uses for two separate purposes. Um, so that's sort of the high level description of how range trees work. Um, now we're going to talk about sort of how the actual asynchronous write allocation process works. So how we allocate a block for an asynchronous write. Um, so the first step when doing an allocation is to pick a disk to do the allocation on. Uh, there's a lot of different heuristics we use here. There's sort of performance related ones and space related ones and lots of different things. But for our purposes for this discussion today, you just pick a disk. Uh, it's basically round robin. You pick one, you move on from there. Uh, once you've selected a disk to use, you have to pick a good seeming meta slab. Um, this ties into the weight that I was discussing earlier and the maximum free segment size I was discussing earlier. If the Metaslab isn't loaded, we have to load that Metaslab. So read in the space map, convert it into the in-memory range tree, um, and do that before we can move on. Uh, once we've done that, or if we didn't need to do that, we find a place in the Metaslab to do the allocation. Um, there are a number of allocation strategies that you can use from the older naive ones like first fit where you sort of, you know, just start at the beginning of the meta slab and search forward until you find a spot that your data will fit in, or best fit, where you search through the offset sorted of tree until you find something that's as close as possible to the right size for your allocation. Um, more modern strategies tend to be things that are uh, a cursor-based approach, which are the ones that ZFS uses. So when you do an allocation, you store that the location of, your, of it in the meta slab's um, data structures. And then when you go to do another allocation, you start at the cursor and do a first fit search for some distance forward from there um, and try to find a place that your data will fit into. If you don't find any place sort of anywhere nearby, you'll go and do a best fit search across the rest of the meta slab. And the reason for this is that, um, especially on spinning disks, but also on SSDs and other kinds of disks, um, it is often beneficial if you can combine a bunch of allocations, logical allocations into a single physically contiguous allocation because then the disk can do those all as one operation and that can substantially improve performance in a lot of cases. Um, so this cursor strategy sort of tries to leverage that fact while still making sure that you can always find a good place to put your data. Um, so whatever allocation strategy you're using, once you've found a spot for your data, you claim that spot and you modify the range trees and you make the necessary modifications to the space maps uh, and then you move on. You're done with your allocation. If you can't find a place in that meta slab to do your allocation, then you need to go back and pick a new meta slab from the same disk. Uh, you know, you may need to load it again, find a new place in that meta slab, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you repeat this process over and over for all the meta slabs in the disk. And if none of them can satisfy your allocation, then you actually need to go all the way back to the top and pick another disk from your pool or another VDEV from your pool, technically. Um, and then you repeat the process, go all the way through. If you've gone through all the disks, all the meta slabs on all those disks, uh, then you do what's called ganging, where you actually break your allocation into smaller pieces and repeat this process. Uh, ZFS treats that as sort of a last resort because it causes significant fragmentation. Um, and so we really try to avoid it whenever possible. Now I've sort of talked through this explanation and made it all sound sort of, there's a lot of data here, a lot to understand. Um, and sort of this, Diagram makes it seems like these are all sort of equally important and equally time consuming, but uh, that's really fairly misleading. Really, if it was uh, trying to be more representative, the explanation would look something more like this. Um, picking a good seeming meta slab can take 100 microseconds. Finding good place in a loaded meta slab can take a couple hundred microseconds. Loading a meta slab can take a second, like an actual, uh, a second. Um, 
And a second is forever in computer time. Like, obviously, that's not something you want to be doing on anything even vaguely resembling a regular basis. And you definitely don't want to be going through this loop multiple times for a single allocation, um, or you're going to be having a really, really bad day. Uh, this diagram is not to scale. That The loading Metaslab text should be much bigger, but it wouldn't fit on the slide in that case. Um, so now we're going to talk about synchronous write allocations. Synchronous writes uh, don't go directly into this asynchronous write allocation process that I talked about. Um, they sort of go directly into the ZIL to do their process. The ZIL has these 128 kilobyte log blocks that it allocates. Um, and you know you come in with your 3 kilobyte or 8 kilobyte or 12 kilobyte write, and the ZIL will just drop your data into that ZIL log block uh, and return control to you as quickly as possible. Um, the ZIL will try to allocate these log blocks from slog devices if they're available, but if not, it'll just allocate them from normal places in the pool. Um, the actual allocation for these log blocks is the same as the async write process, so it goes through that same code path. Um, but the write themselves go into the ZIL. The ZIL will then, if necessary, go into this allocation path. Uh, and then later, after the data has been synced to disk and after some transaction groups have started to sync out, um, the data that's stored in these ZIL blocks will be rewritten like a normal async write. Um, the ZIL blocks are not intended as sort of a permanent resident place for your data, which is why slog devices don't just fill up over time. The data is sort of migrated out of them and into the normal storage areas of your disk, and we can reclaim these uh, slog devices and ZIL blocks for use again. Um, so now I'm going to talk about sort of what we ran into and uh, how we got there and how we dealt with some of the problems we saw. Um, so if you look at the bottom right, this space, this range tree, or this flame graph, I don't know how readable it is on the video, but um, if you look at it carefully and you can read it, uh, you'll see that this flame graph, which we got off of a customer system, um, we spend a lot of our time in the Metaslab allocation code. In fact, we're spending, if you add it all up, uh, over 50% of our time in the allocation code. And that's not good because any time that you're spending in this allocation code is time that you're not spending compressing your data and checksumming your data and writing your data to disk. Um, so clearly something was going on with allocation and that was what sort of spurred our investigation into this area. And what we sort of realized as we did this is that we were kind of at a, at a perfect location to run into these problems. Because um, there's a number of factors that sort of combined together to make them worse and worse and worse for us. So the first one is that we tend to operate on a much smaller record size um, than normal. The normal is 128 kilobytes, as I mentioned. Our default record size is 8 kilobytes. Uh, and this is more common for things like VMDKs or disk images, uh, ZVols and databases, which tend to operate on sort of smaller data sizes because they tend to modify sort of smaller amounts at a time and do lots of these random updates. Uh, and VMDKs and ZVols, of course, are trying to emulate disks, where the default sort of atomic size is 512 bytes or 4 kilobytes. Um, so we tend to use a small record size. And then when you combine that with compression, um, we tend to have a lot of blocks that are, you know, two kilobytes, three kilobytes, three and a half kilobytes, because our data compresses to some extent. So we have lots of these very small blocks um, that are lots of different sizes. And so this there's a lot of different sizes and a lot of small sizes, which can lead to some fragmentation. Um, Another important factor is that we have a heavy synchronous write workload because um, we're operating over NFS, we're operating with databases, uh, and so all of these things uh, tend to use synchronous writes for reliability reasons. Um, and the fact that there's a synchronous write mix has two major effects. One is that there's a large mix of these 128 kilobyte blocks that the ZIL is allocating. Um, and so we have these really, really small, lots of different size blocks, and also these really big blocks. And so we have a very wide range of allocatable sizes, which leads to a lot of fragmentation. Um, and then also, as we've discussed before, sync writes are very latency sensitive. So any time we spend in the allocation code is time that we're not spending issuing more writes um, or doing reads or satisfying other user requests. Uh, and then the final factor is that our customers tend to have fairly fast storage. Uh, ZFS was designed in an era where SSDs and flash storage arrays and NVRAM disks weren't really a thing yet, um, and they certainly weren't common things yet. Um, and so it was designed where, you know, we had this slack time while disks were operating where we could do checksumming and compression and other things. Um, but as storage got faster and faster and faster, CPUs didn't really keep up. Um, and so our slack time has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller if we still want to saturate these very high-end storage devices. Um, and so we really need to sort of cut down on our CPU usage and our memory usage and all of our 
uh, things that aren't just interacting with the disk if we want to keep up with these increasingly fast storage devices. Uh, and so all of these things together are sort of a, came together as sort of a perfect storm to cause terrible performance problems in some of these cases for our customers. Um, so we start digging into it, and the first thing we see is just sort of as a high, very high-level problem is that for some allocation, we call Metislab load a dozen times, like many times, um, a dozen in some of the worst cases. And as I mentioned before, loading a Metislab can take a second. And so if you're spending seconds to do a single allocation, that's really bad. Right? You don't want to be doing seconds per I.O. You want to be doing I.O.s per second. Um, you want the numerator and the no denominator where they should be. Um, so we're wasting a huge amount of CPU loading all these Metislabs. We're wasting a huge amount of memory storing all these range trees and these loaded Metislabs. Um, and we're wasting a huge number of I.O.s reading these space maps off of disk. So why are we doing all these loads that don't end up satisfying an allocation? And in many cases, never satisfy an allocation before they just get unloaded again. Well, the problem sort of stems back to something that we were discussing earlier, the Metislab weight, um, which is the attempt to distill the overall quality of a Metislab into a single integer. Um, it used to be that this was sort of a weighted function of the total amount of free space available in the Metislab, um, but now it's a sort of segment-based approach. Uh, and if you want more details about sort of how that change came to be and why it's a better system, uh, Matt Ahrens gave a talk at BSD CAN a few years ago uh, that I think you can go back and watch that provides a lot of really good information. Um, but to sort of explain how the modern system works, uh, we'll consider an example Metislab. Um, and sort of the, the weight is based on the largest bucket of free segments, and that's sort of the most important information. So if the largest bucket of free segments, all the largest free segments in the Metislab are in this 64 to 128 kilobyte range, then that's sort of uh, one part of the weight. The other part of the weight is the number of segments in that bucket. So if we have a thousand segments that are in that size, then we have a thousand segments in the largest bucket of free space. And that sort of combines together to make the weight. And so this is very useful because it tells you sort of at a glance what kinds of allocations this Metislab can satisfy and how many of them it can satisfy. So if you were to come in with a 64 kilobyte allocation, you would know immediately this Metislab is good for those allocations. It can satisfy lots of them and I can reliably load it and use it. Um, if you come in with a 100 kilobyte allocation, you can say, okay, well, if the free sizes are sort of evenly distributed throughout this bucket space, you know, there's the same, you know, similar numbers of 64K as 120K as 30, like 96K. It can probably satisfy my 100 kilobyte allocation. I should be fine. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of probabilities and shoulds in that sentence, as you may have noticed. And that's what we were getting running into. Um, we were coming in with these 120, 100 kilobyte allocations and not being able to satisfy them uh, because all of the free segments were actually exactly 64 kilobytes. Um, and so we would load these Metislabs and just be totally unable to use them for our allocation. And we would just have to go and load another Metislab and another one and another one. Um, so clearly this weight doesn't have enough information for us to make perfect decisions about uh, loading Metislabs. Um, so this, the idea that we came up with is that um, when the Metislabs are loaded, we have this information uh, that I talked about earlier called the maximum free segment size. And when the Metislab is loaded, that information is always correct. Um, we, you know, as you do allocations, it shrinks. As you do freeze, it grows as necessary. Uh, but we didn't track that information when the Metislab was unloaded. Um, because when the Metislab is unloaded, you can't allocate data from it, but you can still free data to it. Um, and this is sort of a performance uh, optimization in ZFS that's been around for a very long time. Uh, and so we wouldn't cache this information when the Metislab was unloaded uh, so that that way we could still, um, because we didn't trust it to be perfectly accurate. Uh, the insight that we had was that even if it's not perfectly accurate, the maximum free segment size at the time that we unloaded the Metislab is still a good lower bound on the available free space. Um, so as we've issued freeze to it, the actual maximum free segment size may have increased. You know, if it used to be 100, if it was 128 kilobytes when we unloaded it, it might be bigger now, but it's never going to be smaller. Um, so if we just keep this information around, uh, we can use it as sort of a, a rough heuristic to determine whether the uh, Metislab can satisfy the allocation that we want to do. But as more and more freeze get issued to the disk, uh, eventually this heuristic is just going to get worse and worse over time, and it's going to be going to become unreliable. So at some point, we'll age it out. Um, the current behavior is that after an hour, we just stop trusting the number. Um, there were sort of other uh, 
more sophisticated ideas that we came up with and prototyped. And some of them seemed promising, but we didn't end up implementing any of them, um, though we may ba go back and do so at some point in the future. Uh, and the results of this were really strong. On Illumos, we got a 30% increase in IOPS on a heavy read-write workload where we couldn't keep all of these Metaslabs loaded into memory. Um, so that's a very nice performance win in those cases. Uh, so it worked, it worked quite well. Uh, but our customers were still seeing problems. And so we did some more digging. And the problem is that even with every load satisfying an allocation, we're still doing a lot of loads. Um, and the problem is really that the fragmentation was just at critical levels. Um, there just weren't that many buffers that could satisfy the allocations we were trying to do in any given Metaslab. Even if we always picked the very best Metaslab, you know, you have some Metaslabs that have a few 128K, some that have only one, some that have none, and there's this nice sort of curve shape of their, you know, free available space. Um, even if we were always picking the very best ones that could satisfy the most allocations that we would want to do, there just weren't enough buffers available in them. And we were still having to load many of these Metaslabs. Uh, in order to satisfy all the allocations we needed to do, and loading them is very expensive. Um, so we're still running into huge performance problems. So how could we deal with this? How could we make things better? Um, well, it turns out that there's two ways to fix this, right? One is that you just load more Metaslabs uh, and just do it more often, and that has the problems we discussed where loading them is expensive, or you just keep more of them loaded. Um, you don't unload them as quickly. And so this is a, you know, it's the obvious sort of other half of the coin, and it does improve performance quite a bit, but the costs are significant. Um, the range trees take up a lot of memory. So each range segment in these range trees, which I'll be referring to as range segs from now on, uh, it was 72 bytes. Uh, and on one of our customer systems, their average free segment size was three, three and a half kilobytes. So it was pretty fragmented. Uh, and this customer had 100 terabytes of storage. And so if you were to try to load all of these Metaslabs into memory and all of their range trees into memory, you need to use 2.3 terabytes of RAM. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's a huge amount of RAM. The customer had a lot of RAM, but they didn't have that much. And you have other things that you want to do with your RAM. You want to use it to store the ARC. You want to use it to store user programs. Um, and so we were running into situations where customers just didn't have enough memory to store, like to keep more Metaslabs loaded. Um, and we actually had one really extreme case where a customer was trying to do an allocation early in boot. And uh, they were loading Metaslabs and loading Metaslabs and loading more and more and more Metaslabs, and none of them could satisfy the allocation. And they actually used all of the memory on the system uh, to the point where they couldn't load any more Metaslabs, and none of them could satisfy the allocation. So the system just hung because it couldn't unload the Metaslabs uh, until a transaction group had been synced out. Um, that's sort of a separate root cause problem, but it sort of highlights just how bad the memory fragmentation situation was for some of our customers. Um, so the specific problem here is that we're using a lot of memory to store all of these range trees. We need to improve it somehow. Uh, and so the range trees are storing, uh, being stored in these AVL tree data structures. AVL trees are kind of balanced binary search tree. They're very easy to use. They're very nice. Um, but they have some downsides. One of them is that they, uh, the way that they work is that you have these AVL nodes that sort of store the parent and child pointers for the AVL tree. Uh, and you have to allocate those as part of your structure that you want to store in the tree. Um, and since we have two AVL trees as part of each range tree, we were storing two of them as part of each of these range segs. And so that was using 66% of the memory in each range seg, which is a lot of memory. The next thing is that you had to do many, many individual allocations. Each of these range segs was its own separately allocated buffer. Um, and so if you have 100 terabytes of storage and three and a half kilobytes of free space on average, or three free space size, that would be 35 billion segments if you have to store that much free space. Uh, and regardless of sort of the CPU time to load that or the number of disk reads and the amount of memory it's taking, just the amount of time you spend in malloc, that's not, it's not tenable. Um, if you look at the flame graph on the right, that's uh, generated from a test system we had where we were just loading all of the, metas the labs and loading all of the range trees into memory. And that took about 30 to 40 seconds and we spent huge amounts of time in the AVL tree code. Um, we had customer systems where this would take 20 minutes. Um, so it's just not, it wasn't, a, it was, they weren't working well. We needed to do something else. Um, so there were two changes that we made here. One was to switch from an AVL tree to a B tree, which I'll talk about next. And then the other one was to improve the efficiency of the payloads, to improve the range segs themselves to be more efficient. And I'll talk about that after the B tree changes. Um, so B trees are an n-ary search tree. AVL trees are a binary search tree, and those are probably what you're all very familiar with. 
bee trees are an n -ary search tree, which means rather than branch having sort of two children from each node, they have n children from each node, and that n is actually variable. Um, in the AVL trees, as I mentioned, you have to sort of allocate the AVL nodes as part of your structure, and then uh, that's how they do their sort of management, and you do your own allocations. For bee trees, the data is stored entirely in tree-controlled buffers, so it does its own allocations. You don't need to do them, and it tends to allocate sort of, you know, these larger regions. We use four kilobyte regions uh, to store all of this data, um, so it tends to be larger contiguous regions with lower overhead. One nice property that the AVL trees had was that most of the time when you're doing an allocation or a free, you're just modifying the start of the free segment or the end of the free segment to you know grow or shrink the free region. Um, and so you could, with the AVL trees, you could just get a pointer directly to the node and modify the start and the end without having to resort the entire tree. And so we made sure that the B trees were designed and implemented in such a way that we could have that same property. Um, B trees in general are designed to be very low memory overhead for storing large amounts of small objects. Uh, and since these rage segs, we want them to be as small as possible and we need to store a lot of them, they're very well designed for this use case. Uh, and you can also design your B trees in such a way that when you're doing the initial load, so when we're loading our space maps into memory and turning them into these range trees, um, they, can be, uh, they can be in a special optimized mode where they'll pack things more densely and do fewer allocations and use less memory and less CPU. Um, so they have a lot of really nice properties for this use case, which is what, why we decided to go with them. Um, and so at the bottom, you can sort of see what a B tree looks like. You have the root node with all of its data, data represented as squares and all of its child pointers represented as circles. And each of the data values represents a is a separator between two different child pointers, um, which is very similar in concept to an AVL tree or another binary search tree. Uh, but then rather than just having one of those, you scale it up horizontally. So it's sort of a very simple concept. Um, and this proceeds down the tree, child pointers point to internal nodes, point down to more internal nodes, and then at the bottom you have leaf nodes, which just have lots and lots of data and no child pointers. Um, so B trees seemed like a good fit. We implemented them, we switched to them. So next we want to improve the efficiency of the range segments. Um, well, to start, for starters, we can remove these AVL nodes. We're not storing them in AVL trees anymore. Um, and so that's a great start. These things started at 72 bytes each. We removed 48 bytes by removing the AVL nodes. So that's fantastic progress. Um, we've removed two thirds of the memory usage, well done. Uh, but we wanna go further. And so the next insight was that there's three fields remaining in the range seg. There's this RS start, RS end, and RS fill. Each of these is a 64 bit integer. So there's 24 uh, bytes left. This RS fill is used uh, in ZFS to implement sorted scrubs and sorted resilvers and is extremely useful for those use cases. But we don't use it for the free tree, like for the free range trees or the other sort of space trees. Um, and so if we don't need it in those cases, if we can design our range trees to not store that information if we're not using it, um, then we can save eight, eight bytes per range segment. So we can bring it down to 16 bytes. So that's another nice improvement. Um, and then the next insight we had is that these 64-bit integers are giving us full byte level addressing of our entire disks, uh, which is not necessary, right? We don't need to be able to reference data that isn't even in the Metaslab that we're talking about. Um, and in practice, almost all Metaslabs have less than two to the 32 sectors, um, since a sector is between, is you know, usually 512 bytes or four kilobytes, and you have many Metaslabs per disk, there are almost no disks in existence where you have more than two to the 32 sectors. So if we just change this to be a 32 an integer, 32-bit uh, integer by default and then switch to a 64-bit integer when it has a large enough disk, um, then we can save even more memory. We can switch it, we can save another eight bytes by converting the start and end down. Um, and so this diagram actually is to scale. The left side is the old 72-bit version of the range seg and the right side is the new eight-byte version of the range seg or 72-byte and eight-byte. Um, so that's another, it's a very nice uh, sort of memory optimization that we got. So we reduced the segments from 72 bytes to eight bytes. Um, but with the B trees, we have to store two trees, remember the size and offset sorted, and there's no sort of space savings between them. They have to be stored entirely separately. Um, and then B trees, they're not, each node isn't always completely full. Uh, they're somewhere between half full and all the way full because they're of a variable size. So on average, they're about 75% full. And when you combine all these different factors together, uh, you end up with about a 30% memory usage. Um, so that's great. We've cut our memory usage by 70%, huge progress. And we've also reduced some CPU and some other, done some other nice things. Uh, but we can actually do better. So if you think back to what I was talking about for allocation strategies, uh, 
um, with the cursor based approach uh, where we do the first fit and then the best fit approach. Um, it turns out that when you're doing a small allocation, um, less than about 16 kilobytes, something like 99% of the time, the first fit step is going to find a place for you to put your data. Uh, and then 1% of the time, you have to actually go to the size sorted tree and do a best fit approach. Uh, but on the other hand, in the range trees, uh, the space used by each segment is the same no matter how big the segment is. So we were using, and so about 90% of the segments in the range trees were these really small, less than 16 kilobyte segments. So we're using a lot of memory to store something in these size sorted trees that we're almost never taking advantage of, right? We're only 1% of our accesses go to this size sort of tree if you're less than this size, and then 90% of the memory is being used for that. So that doesn't make sense. Um, so if we just don't store those small segments in the size sorted tree, uh, we get a, a bunch more space savings uh, in, in exchange for a small increase in fragmentation when you do occasionally need to go to the size sorted tree with a small allocation. Um, you know, if you get a slightly too large buffer, the odds are decent that the next person to come along and do an allocation will be able to use more of that buffer or the rest of that buffer. Um, so you get a small increase in fragmentation, uh, but in exchange you get a really, really uh, significant decrease in memory and CPU usage for the range trees. Uh, overall, after we made all of these different changes, the range trees were using about 16% as much memory as they used to be, and they were only using about 60% as much CPU to do the actual initial load process. Um, so that's a really, really significant performance when we're using a sixth as much memory. Um, so we could keep so many more of these Metaslabs loaded uh, in exchange for almost no downside. And there was actually one other uh, significant benefit that we got that we weren't even really expecting. In the old model, when you were freeing these segments, these 72 byte segments, because you were unloading a Metaslab or because you were doing allocations or whatever, um, you would free individual segments one at a time and they would be scattered across lots of different pages in memory. And so when you would unload a Metaslab, a lot of the time you would like only return a few pages to the system allocator or not return any pages at all. Because as long as there were any of these segments still allocated on a page, you can't return the page to the system. Um, and so we, uh, when we switched to the B trees, which use these internal four kilobyte buffers, every time you free a B tree, you would actually return a bunch of pages to the system. Even if you were returning you know, the same amount of memory or a smaller amount of memory, you would actually end up returning more pages to the system. So it resulted in unloading, uh, creating much better improvements in responsiveness and like uh, freeing memory much faster. Um, so that was a really nice benefit that we weren't even really expecting to get. Okay, so we've made big progress. We've cut down our memory usage to budge, we've cut down our CPU usage, we've uh, stopped loading as many Metaslabs, but it's still, we're still getting performance problems. Our customers are still running into issues, our test systems are still running into issues. Um, and the problem is really just that there aren't enough blocks. We're trying to do all these Zill allocations of these 128 kilobyte blocks, but it's just too fragmented. The fragmentation is too far gone and we don't have enough of these 128 kilobyte blocks to do all the things we want to do. And so when we don't have any 128 kilobyte blocks left, we force out a transaction group so that we can reclaim some of them by syncing the data from them into sort of permanent homes, uh, as I talked about for the, the Zill earlier. Um, and so we sync, force TXGs to happen faster and faster, and that reduces our efficiency and wastes more and more time. And in general, performance just continued to degrade. Um, and the problem was not that we didn't have free space. We had space to put all of these small data blocks, but we didn't have any large contiguous regions where we could put the ZIL blocks um, because the fragmentation was just too high. And so, to, and so slog devices are sort of, they sound ideal for this purpose, right? It gives you this pristine space where you just do these ZIL allocations and you can do these small allocations later. But there are some downsides. Uh, some of them are logistical. You have to actually go and get slog devices, add them to all your pools. Um, we would need to design management interfaces for slog devices. We need to talk to our customers about, you know, how to set them up and all that kind of stuff. So it's just logistically complicated. And then the other problem is that they're a very large performance bottleneck. Um, our customers have, you know, all SSD, all flash, high-end cloud storage devices, you know, whatever they're using. Um, and if you add just one more disk and force all of the Zill writes to go through that one disk, that's going to become a massive performance bottleneck because all of their writes need to go through that disk. Um, and so it's actually going to result in performance decreases because just now you're running into a bot like a, a significant performance bottleneck that has nothing to do with the CPU and it's all about the disks. Um, so slogs in a sort of naive approach, aren't going to solve our problem. We need something better. 
And so the solution we came up with uh, was a project we called Embedded Slog. And the idea here is that you actually, rather than having separate slog devices, you take the best Metaslab on each disk, where here is best is just the one with the most free space, and you make that Metaslab into a mini slog. Um, and so you try to use that Metaslab to do all of your Zill allocations on that disk whenever possible. And so one nice thing about this is that it was both forwards and backwards compatible in ZFS. Because there's no on-disk format changes, it's purely an internal like allocator preference change. It works on old pools, it works on new pools, and you can import old pools on new systems and new pools on old systems, and it'll all just work correctly. Um, you get the most performance improvements when you create a pool and populate it with this code running. Um, but if you were to import an old pool on a new system and sort of uh, it would pick the best Metaslab that it had available. And then over time, as frees get issued to that Metaslab, it'll get better and better as a mini slog. Um, so it had a lot of really nice behaviors and it worked really elegantly. Uh, and we'll still use this embedded slog Metaslab for allocations if we have to. We're not just gonna throw away this 0.5% of your disk. Um, but by and large, it only gets used for these uh, Zill allocations whenever possible. Um, so this, it turns out, got us another really, really nice performance win on a random synchronous write workload uh, where you know we had this incredibly high fragmentation where we just didn't have enough Zill space to allocate Zill blocks. Um, we got a 40 to 50% IOPS increase. I think this was on Linux when we did this initial testing. Um, so it was a very, very nice win. We got really significant performance improvements. Um, and this finally managed to get our customers and our test systems to places where you know, performance isn't perfect, it can always be better, uh, but they were no longer running into sort of these really crippling problems with allocation. Um, and so that's sort of all the different problems that we ran into in the projects that we came up with to resolve them. Um, so the current status of these changes, uh, so the load and unload changes, um, caching the max size, keeping more Metaslab loaded, uh, parallel allocation, and a few other things, all of those changes are in open ZFS master and have been for some time. The B-tree changes and the range seg and range tree changes are in OpenZFS master as well. Um, the embedded slog code has not yet been upstreamed, but if you want to take a look at it, you can actually go look at the Delphix ZFS repository and it's there, uh, it's on our GitHub page. Um, and then there's another project in sort of the synchronous write workload space uh, that I didn't talk about today and won't be talking about in too much detail. But if you want to learn more about it, Seraphim Dimitropoulos uh, from Delphix gave a great talk at the OpenZFS Dev Summit in 2017. Um, called the Log Space Map Project, which is a different sort of on-disk structure for the space maps that we use. Um, and that's actually an open ZFS 0 0.8. Uh, so a lot of you may already be running that major release and may already be getting benefits from that. Um, so I hope now you better understand sort of how allocation works in ZFS, uh, how synchronous writes interact with allocation in ZFS, and some of the problems and exciting things that we ran into when we were dealing with that. Uh, I think I have a little bit of time now for Q&A. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed this.